The talk will be about patience. The uh, dictionary, Cambridge Dictionary, uh, defines it as the ability to accept delay, suffering, or annoyance without complaining or becoming angry. So, uh, well, you know, some of those things, annoyances occur daily, complaining is often a default, and certainly some situations, many do make us angry. The Buddha said, patient endurance is the supreme austerity. That's from the Dhammapada, the collection of sayings by the Buddha. In the Pali tradition, which is uh, Theravada, insight, meditation, different words for it, the path of the bodhisattvas is described in terms of 10 paramis or perfections. Patience shows up here in the Theravada teachings of the Buddha, as well as in other traditions, such as in Maya, uh, Mayahana traditions, Mayana traditions, such as um, Zen, which is my grounding, my uh, foundation, Mahayana. And um, it also shows up in other uh, religions and spiritual practices. And it shows up in Zen, Mahayana as uh, the paramitas, six paramitas. So patience shows up everywhere. In the 10 perfections, it's the six of the 10 perfections, um, and uh, being generosity, I'm giving you the English words, of course, there's a Pali word, dana, generosity, sila, virtue, nekam, nekama, which is renunciation, panya, Transcendental wisdom or insight, virya, which is energy, diligence, vigor, effort, kanti, which is patience, tolerance, forbearance, acceptance, satya or saka, some people say, truthfulness and honesty, aditana, determination and resolution, metta, here's metta again, loving kindness, upeka shows up equanimity. So these qualities are all connected and aligned to, uh, all aligned with the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes, and wisdom and compassion are there throughout all of this, the paramis, the Brahma Viharas. As we face a tumultuous world, we can reflect on how we cultivate patience in our everyday lives, whether it's with ourselves, our inner selves, our outer selves, people around us, our co-workers, and our community. And my hope is that you can apply, as I mentioned at the beginning, this virtue to your practice um, and support others as they cultivate uh, patience as well. So whatever we cultivate, uh, the paramis, the Brahma Viharas, patience is really the, I would say it's like equanimity. It's the base drum that carries us through. And I feel that this is one of the, um, I live with, with this practice every day. In Buddhism, patience is viewed as the highest virtue. It requires us to embody all of the Buddha's teachings, and with all the dukkha and suffering, as I mentioned before, these virtues really need to remain constant in our lives. I don't think there's one other parami that's so prominent in my life that I struggle with it um, many times throughout the day. Sometimes it goes up and down. It's a practice from the time I wake up throughout my day. I'm reminded of this journey. For many of us, patience is tested in, in some of the smallest little ways, little irritants or big life changes. Big changes in our lives will test our patience as well too. Our relationship with others, ourself, the government, the environment, our workplace, and sometimes even the smallest and more, most mundane activities are a test. An insect in the room, a fly, cold air, warm air, too hot. I used to say that in that I wanted enlightenment in this lifetime because I refused to be reborn and come back and have to stand 
in line at the DMV. For those of you that are abroad, it's our Department of Motor Vehicles. I just couldn't face another lifetime of doing that. It seemed to be the ultimate dukkha. Who hasn't wished they couldn't be transported? Click your heels like, like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz and be transported somewhere else. But then, you know, there is an audacity to that impatience. There's an audacity that accompanies patients somehow thinking that I should really be in the front of that line. I should be the one whose ticket is being called now, regardless of when I arrived. There's sort of a, a narcissism and an arrogance, I think, uh, that comes with uh, being impatient. And we don't mean to do it. It's just there. As a child, my mother would say that patience is a virtue and that I had none. So that was an interesting message that I lacked this virtue. But I understood what she meant. And, but I also thought patience was something hard, which it is. And no, but no one could tell me how to develop it. They could just, they just said, be patient, but no one ever said, take a deep breath, do this slowly. I remember being 12 and trying to learn how to sew and didn't want to read the instructions. Those patterns, those of you that are my generation and people sewed with patterns, I thought I would just bypass it, I would wing it, and because I just wanted to wear that dress the next day. But it didn't quite work out that way. So I'd like you to sit for a minute, just a second, half a minute, and think about what messages you received growing up about patience. What comes to your awareness? What arises for you when you think about patience? Or it could be a feeling, it could be a thought, maybe your relationship with it. Would you describe yourself as a patient person? Would someone describe you as a patient person? <laughs> I love some of these sayings in chat that are coming in. Someone said, I think it's important to remember that thoughtful action follows patient attention. That we aren't merely silent, but contemplative, of course. I love Lily Tomlin's quote. Sometimes I can be patiently impatient. Ah. Yes, it's a process, right? And then it's sometimes, I hear sometimes. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. That's sort of life, right? Well, our culture with all of the expectations, all the pressing timelines, the technology, it really doesn't support patience. That's why we practice. That's why we're meditation, Buddhist, mindfulness students. We're expected to produce quickly, to respond quickly, to move rapidly when things are not working out, to move on. Western culture teaches us to keep ahead, to keep ahead of the game. It's no wonder that some of us fall into this mode. Even at retreat, I see people rushing. I even see some of the teachers on residential retreats rushing up to the, to the great hall to sit. We fall into this and expect ourselves and others to fall into step with us. Expectations are so high that they cause us sometimes to function outside of our body, outside of our present. When we're not present, we're operating outside of ourselves, always thinking about what has to be done or wanting something to occur like it was before. Our culture wants us to be efficient, to do everything quickly and perfectly, or we might be obsolete, which is a terrible fear of many of us, being obsolete, not being heard, not being relevant, or falling behind. I remember years ago, there was a sneaker ad. Some of you might remember it, for those of you that are in the US, and the slogan was, just do it. I won't name the brand, but it was, just do it. Well, at that time, I was working with young people, a lot of young uh, people who were struggling on the streets, who were school, um, uh, struggling with completing school, finding a job, and really finding street life tempting. So 
here, you know, as a teacher, I worked as a teacher trying to get them to be patient and mindful in the classroom. But then once they stepped outside, everything, all the messages were telling them, just go for it. Go for it now and come home with it at the end of the day, regardless of consequences. Go after what you want, regardless of what happens. Deal with that later. I watched their lives played out and many were successful and were able to stay and have perseverance, but some weren't. They didn't have the role models around them or they simply couldn't because they felt like they had to survive. And many were dealing with trauma, past trauma, ancestral trauma. Um, and I had to be patient as well and not judge their impatience as a failing. So a lack of patience can lead to compulsive behavior, anger, harm to self and others. It can be a form of arrogance and narcissism that we are the center. We are the center. Everything rolls around how we want it done, when we want it done. And it certainly moves us away from ease and calm. By being patient, we're able to reflect on how we practice the divine abodes as well, how they show up for us. Because to practice it, to embrace and embody loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, it's really about respect, respect for our path and the path of others and seeing who they are, seeing where they're at in their growth. And yet, our greatest teachers can come from those close to us who test us continuously. It can be an irritant, like someone leaving the lights on all the time or simply wanting them to hurry up. How many times have we hurried, those of you who have children or work with young people or even work with uh, people your age or people older than you, wanting them to hurry up? It only serves to rattle or, or frustrate everyone. Often when we're impatient, we create more chaos. We're not being mindful. We're not paying attention to our own capabilities and that of others. Accidents happen. Mishaps happen. Our sympathetic nervous system is in full force, fight or flight. So there is merit in pausing, waiting to quell that reactive mind, that emotion that might be bu bubbling up, and then responding appropriately. It's also important to be resourced, to be fully resourced. You know what I mean by resourced? You're not tired, you're not hungry or hangry, as some people will say, because the hunger can lead to anger. So some people say they're hangry. And feeling impoverished or fearful that time's running out. Sometimes as we get older, we become more impatient because we've been there. We've said this, we've heard it. So I wanna share a writing from the monastic, the eighth century monastic Shanti Deva, who was a scholar in India and teacher on patience. He said, all the virtuous deeds and merit, such as giving and making offerings that we have accumulated over thousands of eons can be destroyed by just one moment of anger. Just one moment. There's no evil greater than anger, no virtue greater than patience. Therefore, I strive in various ways to become familiar with the practice of patience. If I harbor painful thoughts of anger, I shall not experience mental peace. I shall find no joy or happiness, and I shall be unsettled and unable to sleep. Now, it's important to stress, as some of you have brought up, that patience is not about passivity or complacency or weakness. There's an energy and a gentle strength in embodying patience. It's a quality that allows us to see clearly through challenges by applying compassion and wisdom. These two things, they show up in the Brahma Viharas, opening space through our meditation, through our grounding to respond mindfully rather than react unskillfully. That's why it's referred to as the highest virtue. It's an expression of our highest self. So think of the highest virtue 
as something you already embody that already exists and it's, and it's an expression of that highest virtue. It's a way to learn and it requires us to be intentional about learning new skills and behaviors, creating space for anything that might unfold, including the impatience. So when we create space through meditation, through walking, through um, just being in stillness, we are creating space for both and we need to be comfortable with both showing up. One way I mentioned finding an anchor in your breath or grounding or um, a sensation is coming up with your own mantras. My mother's mantra, I'll share with you. I just thought of it. I hadn't thought of it was, Lord, help me. <laughs> that was her mantra that would bring her back. But your mantra could be something like, uh, or words of wisdom, I'm willing to wait. This too shall pass. I will be cared for. Or I'm cultivating gentle strength. When I first started practicing Zazen, I was quite young. I was a teenager. And at that time, I thought everything was a quick fix. So I thought, well, if I read this book, if I study, if I go to see this teacher, uh, I should be enlightened maybe a few months. Okay, this is what you think when you're 17 or 18. So when I sat my first session, which is extended practice, extended day, over a week or 10 days or nine days, I thought it's got to happen. It's bound to happen during the session, right? And then as my legs and knees just felt so painful, so painful, I thought it's got to happen today. It's got to happen today. And if it happens today and I'm enlightened today, well, I won't have to sit the rest of the session. Okay, so this is the mind of a teenager. However, I think this sense of impatience, not as extreme as that, often stays with us. Like I should be, I've been practicing five years, 10 years, five months, five decades. I should be here. And what I've come to realize is that it doesn't come down like a bolt from the sky. It unfolds, it unfolds, it unfolds over time. And we have to be willing to live with this, you know, impatience and be able to flip it around and be patient. So meditation, of course, is one way, and we do this with intention. When we talk about resolve, it's not about gritting your teeth or endurance. It's really a gentle, a gentle strength that we have. And um, there are like three aspects to uh, patience, three aspects, if you think of it, if you think of it as a three-sided, a three-sided coin. The first is perseverance. It means sticking with it, staying with it. There's a sense of continuity, of calm endurance. It's the ability to stay focused, steady our efforts, right? Steady our efforts, be dedicated to and engage with this continuity. So what might that mean? It could mean meditating every day or as often as you can and staying with the process step by step. By staying with the process, we remove doubt and fear about whether or not we're going to be able to take the next step. So those small steps help with continuity. This is resolve. It keeps us in the moment, moment by moment. It helps us to think about the present and not just the goal. It requires wisdom and compassion. I keep saying it, wisdom and compassion. and to be without judgment of our process. We let go of where we should be on the path, comparing ourselves to others. Some of the people that I started meditating with are now abbots of Zen centers and other centers and are teaching and have written books. And there were times when I thought, hmm, but then this has been my path, working with kids in the street, working with uh, survivors of violence, 
And this strength and resilience keeps us going and allows us not to succumb to despair or engage in anger, but it's a quiet resting and a recognition of how this virtue shows up in us. Suzuki Roshi, the Zen master, who was also my first teacher, he said, the problem with the word patience is that it implies we are waiting for something to get better. We're waiting for something to fall out of the sky. Our day will come, something will come. A more accurate word for this quality is constancy, a capacity to be what is true moment after moment. That's all we have is this moment. To discover enlightenment one moment after another, patient means understanding that what we seek is always here. What we seek is always here. And one way that we can sort of balance when we talked the last time about equanimity of balancing things, it's not taking ourselves so seriously. Maybe laughing at our impatience. I remember my sister laughed. She was so convinced. She was waiting all day for her partner to give her her birthday present. And because he didn't, by a certain time, she called me and said, I know he forgot. I know he forgot. I know he forgot. And then she called me about an hour later and said, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. Of course he had something for me. And she had to laugh. And we laughed. Being fully present. And also being fully present. Do you remember during the, the meditation, I said, of what's not hurting? Is there a part of us that's just neutral and expressing gratitude for the parts of our lives that are going well? What would it feel like to release, to be patient right now? How can I create space for serenity in my life? How can I slow down and enjoy some sliver of joy? So it's an openness to retraining our minds, this wide field to explore. It's almost like a wild field of flowers, you know, to, to be able to just walk through it and explore. What else? What else is there? How will this show up? The second form of patience um, is referred to as patient as forbearance, showing patience even though something might be owed, or patience under insult, another term. The ability to go through challenges, difficulties, or insults done to us, but not to foster anger or hostility or focus on retaliation. So this is the part that people sometimes say, hmm, but it doesn't mean we don't care for ourselves, that we're doormats, or that we don't care for loved ones, or that we don't want to protect ourselves or loved ones. We don't fall prey to triggers that in turn harm ourselves or others. We don't succumb to those emotions that are reactive and might be harmful. However, there are times when we have to react. There are times when that fight or flight has to kick in. Someone swerves, someone cuts you off, there's danger, and we have to stand up for our rights and the rights of others. At times, our actions are for survival. And we have this gift of being able to, we also have this gift of being able to pause and discern. This is mindfulness. We don't always do it in time. Often we say, ah, I should have acted, I waited too long, and that's okay. But the mindfulness, the meditation helps us to be able to uh, ground ourselves. So this reflection guides us back to right action, right thought. This pause allows us to be freeing. It frees us up from mental strain. It frees us up for not feeling like I need to respond immediately. I need to give that person a piece of my mind or I need to save that person who may not even want saving. Perhaps we gain a deeper understanding of ourselves and the circumstances, changing our point of reference empathizing with the other person, but empathy doesn't mean condoning, okay? It means we recognize what's going on for that person, we recognize their humanity, and we recognize the possibility of whatever they're doing or feeling in ourselves. So we can label people as being cruel or angry or mean or, or impatient, without recognizing that we have the potential 
to carry those same emotions. We have some of the same fragilities and we may be causing transgressions now or have caused it in the past. Which means we want others to be patient with us now and in the future. The Dalai Lama said the practice of patience protects us from losing our composure. In doing that, it enables us to exercise discernment. That's the key with the precepts, the paramis, it's discernment. Even in the heat of difficult situations, it gives us inner space. And in, within that space, we gain a degree of self-control, which allows us to respond to situations in an appropriate and compassionate manner, rather than being driven by angry. So here's a story that I love. Once an angry man insulted the Buddha. The Buddha simply asked the man, um, if people, if people, well, I don't know about the insulting part, but that's part of the story. I'll lead you to interpret, interpret that. The Buddha simply asked the man if people ever visited him in his home. Surprised at the change of topic, so the man gave what he thought was an insult to the Buddha. And then the Buddha says, do people ever visit you in your home? Surprised at the change of the topic, the man answered yes. The Buddha then asked if his visitors ever brought gifts. When the man replied yes again, the Buddha asked what would happen if he refused to accept the gifts? Who would the gifts belong to then? The man said, of course, they would still belong to those who brought them. The Buddha then calmly said, and I imagine in the same way, since I do not accept your insults, they remain with you. So I like that story. You recognize the insult, but you don't have to embody it, right? You don't have to embody it. The third aspect of uh, patience, remember I said there were three, like three prongs, is acceptance. Acceptance without resistance. Seeing things as they are and accepting the reality of our environment, our circumstances, recognizing that there are things not in our control, whether it's environmental or political or cultural climates. But this doesn't mean complacency again. Simply put, it means we're not in conflict with reality not attaching to what should be. Otherwise, we will continue this suffering because we can't control it. At this point in my life, I accept a lot of my limitations. And if I insisted on being a ballerina at this point, I will, and to be on the stage, I will experience suffering. So it's not being in conflict with what is. Maybe laughing about what isn't. So it doesn't mean we stop working to remedy harm. Okay. But we know what our realm is. Otherwise, we would be delusional. Now, this is sometimes a challenge to grasp, but I encourage you to sit with this. I want to differentiate between passive patients and active patients. Has anyone? Heard that concept, those concepts, passive and active patients. Passive patience is waiting for such circumstances around you to change, waiting it out, which is in and of itself not a bad thing. It could be useful or it could be harmful, um, but time will tell. So waiting out a situation. But active patience is recognizing and accepting what is and developing a sense of your own agency to engage in a process to prevent self-harm and harm to others. It's recognizing injustices, structures that feed injustices and working and being and being actively involved in that kind of patience, knowing that it's a process knowing that there are protocols, 
and feeling a sense of agency that you can work to support, to influence perhaps. If you're on phone trees, you may influence, but you cannot control which button that person presses the day they go to vote. It's being an active participant. So for caring for a sick person, a loved one, we do all we can to support the healing and well-being. We advocate. We don't simply wait by their bedside, staring at them to see if they will heal on their own. If you expect your partner, someone close to you or a coworker to go for counseling or help to deal with destructive behavior, and that person feels they're not ready, but you are, then you either engage in passive patience and wait it out, or you know that passive patience is not for you. You need to move on. So it's that discernment. Does that make sense? If you're trying to work with someone, get them, save them, and they're not, they're not um, ready for it, then it means that you decide, you discern. So someone just asked me to define active patience again. It's being aware of what is, being conscious of the reality, not being in conflict with what is, such as aging, but active patience is recognizing what you can do, what's within your realm, and what you cannot control. So if you can, you know, if you can be involved in, in supporting change, if you can be involved in uh, supporting someone, if you can be involved in reducing harm, that's active patience. Passive patience would be saying, it's let it just play it out on its own. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's differenti differentiating. And you can be frustrated with what's around you. This is not saying that you're your, um, you know, that you can't feel frustration or anxiety or anxiousness, but it's recognizing where you put your energy that benefits you, your practice, and others to reduce harm. So I hope the analogy of an ill person versus a, uh, you know, sort of staring, waiting for them to get better on their own, or actually helping them out, calling the doctor, changing hospitals, helping, helping them along with it. And it requires some agreement if you're working with someone else, some sort of alignment. We do accept, we may not like it, but we do accept that there are people out there who are bent on causing harm. And by accepting, we mean that we, we are, we recognize that that is a reality. We don't have to like it. When we say we lose patience with a situation or person, it's not the circumstance, it's how we show up with our impatience. It's how we experience the event and react to it. So accepting the truth about ourselves, recognizing what is, and recognizing uh, this recognition, this awareness of what is, really becomes our baseline, our starting point to say, I am so impatient with this person. I've heard that story over and over. I'm tired of waiting. Be one with that. Just recognize that and um, and uh, recognize it and then recognize your role, your agency with working with that. So I hope that helps stress that it's not about passivity or complacency. Patience is strength. It, there's an energy to patience. It's a loving strength, a loving, a loving energy. And then the, the issue of humility comes into play as well, too. Letting go of ourselves being the center of everything. How humbling is it to take a step back and su succumb, really, to that? So here's another story that I love. This one I like even better kind of reminds me a little bit of me when I was young. An enthusiastic young Zen student sought out his teacher and asked, Master, if I work hard, how soon can I find Zen? His teacher replied, 10 years. But sir, if I work even harder and apply myself wholeheartedly, 
20 years, came the reply. The student persisted, but master, what if I throw myself into practice, immerse myself in it? How long would it take then? Ah, 30 years. The student was crestfallen. Master, I don't understand. Each time I say I'll increase my efforts, you say it will take longer, why? Said the teacher, when one eye is fixed on the goal, you only have one eye on your path. Focus on the effort, not the reward at the end of it. So impatience is like having one eye on the goal, right? I gotta finish, I gotta hurry up, I wish this would happen and wanting what's ahead so much, not paying attention to all that is in front of us. Have you ever walked down steps and missed that last step? Because you really thought you were at the bottom already. I shouldn't laugh because my husband injured himself like that. So there's a hunger, a greed, a wanting, a craving that comes with impatience. Craving begets more craving. I know it sounds a little evangelical, but it really means more suffering. And accepting this reality allows us to move ahead. So just some tips before we end. Um, tapping into what's occurring, like we did in your meditation, what's occurring in your body, your breath, and remembering to bring yourself to the present, not wanting to be at another place at another time. Every time you say, I wish this, I wish that, I wish this were over, I wish I could get out of line. Those are all human, natural, survival defaults. But just paying attention to that. Finding an anchor with your breath, meditating, yoga, qigong, walking, being with your pet. Pets often slow us down. Creating your own mantra to slow down activation. Anything to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, that's the system that brings us down, relaxes us, and brings us back to us. Pausing, reframing with humor, maybe. Just have a good laugh at yourself once in a while. Persevering, the three prongs, perseverance. Again, it's not gritting your teeth like, you know, but staying with the situation, being in the present step by step, step by step, continuous practice and intention, forbearance, not succumbing to insult, giving it back, having them take those gifts back home, protecting yourself and others if necessary, but not reacting in a way that causes harm or where we sort of literally kind of lose our sense of self and accepting meaning dealing and accepting what is, being aware of what is. Again, it's not condoning, embracing, loving. It's just I accepting the fact that it will rain someday. It may not rain when it doesn't. Time is marching on. We will age. We will all move into that path of death. We are on the path of death, accepting that. Some people don't, I know. Um, they do all sorts of things to um, to um, to deny it. It doesn't mean you don't do yoga, you don't eat well. You want whatever is remaining to be with ease. That's a different kind. That's a different kind of agency or acceptance, right? So as we move into this challenging period in our country's history, and for those of you abroad, you are probably well aware this is a challenge. There are challenges in our country, but not just here. Again, we are not the center, the US, as we sometimes think of the universe. There are all sorts of conflicts. There are all sorts of harm being um, uh, uh, um, imposed on others. There's death and destruction. It's a difficult time. It's always been a difficult time, and it's even more difficult now because we have, for us, because we have so much access, this constant feed daily, daily, daily of what's going on. So our practice has to be really intentional. 
Nelson Mandela, I want to leave you with this quote, who I think really sort of embodied um, this symbol of patience. I did have the opportunity, some of you may have, to actually see him in person. And what, um, here's this man who labored in prison, and I saw that prison for 27 years. And he emerged with a radiant smile, happy for his own liberation and the opportunity and work with agency, knowing that it was a process to work for the liberation of, of others. So holding this vision beyond his own liberation, but beyond himself, beyond himself. He said, I learned to have the patience to listen when people put forward their views, even if I think those views are wrong. You can't reach a just decision in a dispute unless you listen to both sides. Unless you listen to both sides. So I will um, invite you throughout the week, the month, the year, whenever, especially as we lead up to this next few months, to explore your relationship with patients, what you may be able to do intentionally, where you may have um, where you may have um, passive patients, which is not a bad thing, or active patients. And for those that have um, that missed the um, the blessing, the saying, I did put it in, and I will um, put the quote. It's in such big bold letters. Let me see if I can put it in chat without it um, maybe um, maybe um, I can put it in chat and uh, see how it comes up, okay? Because I'm working off too now. So I will send you the, I'll do the blessing for you again. And I will leave you with, um, may you be happy with who or where you are. May you be at ease. May you recognize your strength. And may you free yourself with patience, with patience, through patience. May not be exactly what's in there, but that's the gist of it. May you be happy. May you have strength. May you have ease. And may you free yourself 